Hey guys, in this video, I want to talk to you about an introduction into titrations. So when you're working on acid-base titration, we've worked titrations before, actually, if you remember in electrochemistry, we did what we call redox titration. What was happening there in the redox titration is we were transferring electrons. And because when we have certain oxidation states of certain elements, um, especially your transition metals, then you can get different color changes due to the transition state. So what we did in that lab um, back in the redox titration is we had hydrogen peroxide and uh, potassium permanganate. And we, we titrated until the manganate, uh, manganese sorry, uh, turned from a plus 7 to a plus 4 oxidation state. And when it did so, it was a purple color and it changed to a light pink color in our flask. So um, if you, that isn't ringing a bell, you might want to go back and review uh, that lab. How acid base titrations are different from redox titrations is you're not necessarily transferring electrons here. What we're basically doing is we're transferring protons. So you have a base and an acid that's present. And when your base and your acid react, your acid is going to donate a proton to the base. And so we have to use, in order to get a color change here, we have to use something called an indicator. And an indicator is basically just a weak acid. And when it actually donates its proton, when it gives off that proton, um, it changes color. Okay, and so we're going to talk about those common indicators later on. But I was just going to give you kind of like an overview of, of what's happening here. So what I have is a computer simulation of a titration setup and we're going to actually be doing this in lab so you'll get the real life experience uh, later on. So what I have in this burette here, so this long skinny tube is called a burette and what is in there is sodium hydroxide. So we have NaOH that is present there. Whatever is present in your burette, that is called your titrant. It's the stuff that you're titrating with, okay? So the stuff in your burette is called the titrant always. Very important term to know. Your titrant can be a number of things. It can be a strong base that's present in here. It can be a strong acid that's present in here. Or it could essentially, we don't really use this in AP, be a weak acid or a weak base as well. Most of the time, um, we deal with strong bases and strong acids that are present in our burette as our titrant, especially for AP. Now, the thing that is in our flask, um, this is known as our analyte. It is the thing that we are trying to analyze, we are trying to find information about. So the stuff in our flask is the analyte. Now what I actually have present in my analyte in this simulation is a weak acid, specifically acetic acid. And this is actually what we are going to be doing in our lab. We're going to have acetic acid here. We're going to have sodium hydroxide in our burette. All right. So this is very similar to what we'll actually be doing. The analyte, the whole purpose of this analyte, is we're trying to find a couple of things, all right? One thing that you could potentially find of, of the analyte is its molar mass, okay? Um, you could possibly have this uh, acetic acid in the form of a, a, a solid, and you dissolve it in some water, and you want to figure out uh, what is the molar mass or what is the um, actual identity of that analyte. Another thing that you can figure out from, from your analyte is uh, what is its concentration. Okay, and this is mainly what we deal with is figuring out its concentration and this is what we're going to do in our lab as well. So our analyte, we basically have some piece missing piece of information of it. So what we have to do is proceed with this titration in order to find this missing information, okay? There's another thing that also goes in your flask and that is called your indicator. And we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit later on. 
Remember I said your indicator is a weak acid and it actually changes color. It's basically letting you know that you're finished with your titration. Okay, so now that we know the different parts of a titration, what exactly are we doing here? Well, you actually know the volume of the, uh, <clears throat> of the uh, analyte that you have, and um, you actually are trying to figure out the molarity or you're trying to figure out the molar mass. So the simulation has it included in there, but we don't necessarily need it. Um, what we do know, however, okay, so we know this volume. Yes, we don't know the molarity. What we do know is the molarity and we can figure out the volume of the titrant. Now, when we know the molarity of this titrant, we call that a standardized solution. So standardized means that we know the exact molarity of that titrant. Well, uh, for my double period kids, what we're going to actually be doing in the lab is we're going to make our own solution of sodium hydroxide and we're going to standardize it ourselves, which is a separate lab from figuring out what the analyte is. Okay. So standardize again means that I know the exact molarity. And so what I'm going to do, let me kind of work through this simulation here, is I'm going to add, you see how this is a colorless solution right here. Okay, well, the indicator that I'm using is fetal phthalene. And what fetal phthalene is, um, it's an indicator, uh, of course, it's a weak acid. It, when it's donating as proton, it's going to uh, change color. And when it, it actually does that process is around these pH ranges, so 8.2 to 10. So if you kind of uh, understand what the, what the pH range stuff is, is um, 8.2 to 10, that is a basic range. OK, so as the solution is getting more and more basic because the indicator is present there. And once it gets into this pH range here, that is when we will actually see a color change. And when we see that color change, if we have chosen the correct indicator, that color change happens at something that we call an endpoint. All right. So let me write that down so you can understand that term. Endpoint is when you have a color change for your indicator. So let's see if we can witness that here. I'm going to add some of my thing. All right. So I'm going to keep adding, keep adding. Oh, I went too far. But you guys get the idea. You saw in the bottom of the flask that you have a color change here. It was colorless and now it's like a dark pink color. You actually want a very faint pink color when you're actually doing this in lab. So you're going to obviously be more careful rather than just dropping base in like I did here. All right. So um, what is actually happening here? What's causing the color change? Well, phenolphthalein is going to change from colorless to a faint pink or purple at the pH range of 8.2 to 10. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm making this solution more and more basic because I am adding strong base to the weak acid. So here's the reaction that we have going on up at the top. HA symbolizes a, an acid of any sort. All right? Remember acids have an, a proton that it can give, so there's an H in front of some combination of something. The NOH is our titrant. So if we remember what an acid and base does, the acid is going to donate a proton, which is the H plus here, to the base. Well, when the H donates to the base, it's going to form H plus OH. That's going to form water. When uh, you have that going on, now I have the A minus put together. Well, I have the Na here as well. So Na plus and A minus is going to form a compound here. And we call this compound here a salt. And so later on, we're going to talk about pH of salts and what a salt is, whether it's acidic, basic, or neutral, and stuff like that. Now, this is not a net ionic equation because remember, we have to refer to solubility rules and all of that good stuff. 
So if we do refer to solubility rules and we uh, apply our knowledge of that, we should see that sodium hydroxide, because it is a strong base, is actually soluble. So it's a little aqueous symbol here. And NAA, because sodium is a group one, this will also be aqueous as well. So if we have two things that are aqueous, uh, both of the products and the reactants, then that means it is a spectator ion. So you see in this net ionic equation below, you don't have any uh, spectator ions present there. And so if we ever have to write these reactions for a... Uh, free response question or whatnot, we absolutely have to write the net ionic form. So don't forget to do that. So we can s clearly see, maybe a little bit better even, that the H plus is being donated to the base to form water. So this is our acid. This is our base. When the acid donates the proton to the base, it then becomes my conjugate acid. And when the acid has, or, or my base has now become my conjugate acid, right? Let's just review those acid-base pairs. So this is an acid-base pair. My acid, once it has donated the H+, what is left over now is known as my conjugate base. So I have my conjugate base that is present here, and my acid-base pair is... HA and A minus, acid conjugate base, base conjugate acid, those are my pairs, okay? So this is the reaction that's happening in here. And once you get to a desired pH, once this reaction is kind of um, gone to completion, as long as I chose my correct indicator, I will have something reached called an equivalence point. What an equivalence point is, is when basically my reaction has gone to completion. When all of this acid has been neutralized, essentially, by this base. And so what we can do is use the information from this equivalence point in order to find our unknown piece of information. So... If I have chosen the correct indicator, then my end point and my equivalent point will be one in the same. Basically, they will happen at the same time. So there are a couple of rules to figure out how to choose your correct indicator. What you have is a pH curve. If I were to test the pH inside of this flask and I were to kind of record that pH along the way as I'm adding volume of base, adding volume of base, adding volume of base, and especially if this is a weak acid as my analyte and a strong base as my titrant, I'm going to get a curve that looks something like this. Okay, we are going to dive deep into these titration curves in the next video, but I just want to kind of show you um, a little bit of an introductory into that. So this is my titration uh, along the way, and I'm recording my pHs. You see how we have kind of like a spike in the pH right in this area. This spike in the pH means that I have eliminated, essentially, all of this weak acid or whatever my analyte is. And so we get a spike. And at the middle of that spike, that is what we call the equivalence point. All right, remember we said the equivalence point is when all of this analyte has been eliminated. So, if I choose the correct indicator, you see how I can look at this graph and figure out what the pH is at the equivalence point. Well, I want my pH range of these indicators of when they change color to be the same as the pH that I see on my titration curve that occurs at, at the equivalence point. Okay, so if I were to actually put numbers here, here's what I would see. 
this pH of this particular lab would be greater than seven. So I definitely wouldn't want to choose methyl orange for my indicator because it changes color around 3.2 and 4, and that's not where my equivalence point is. Same thing as bromothymol blue. It changes color between 6 and 7.6, .6, and that's not where my equivalence point is for this particular combination of, of things. I could choose either phenolphthalein, which is the most common indicator we do use when you have a weak acid for my analyte and strong base for my titrant. So this is the guy that we mostly use. Or I could have possibly chosen thymol blue as well. Okay, so the first rule of how to choose the correct indicator and why do we want to choose the correct indicator? We want to choose it because we want the endpoint, which is the color change, to be the exact same time, the exact same as the equivalence point where, where all of this has been eliminated or neutralized. So <clears throat> that is why we use phenolphthalein to be the correct indicator. Now, sometimes we do not, uh, we are not given pH ranges that these indicators are. Instead, we're given something known as a pKa value. All right. Now, Ka, if you remember, is the acid dissociation constant at equilibrium. pKa, this little p here, means something specific. This little p means negative log. All right, so negative log of Ka is essentially what pKa means. And it makes sense that we're using Ka, right? Because all these guys are essentially just little weak acids. All right, so if we look at the pKa and that pKa value is equal to the pH at the equivalence point, then we have the correct indicator. So again, if we aren't given these pH ranges that I'm given here, and instead we're given pKa values, then what we will be, uh, how we will find the correct indicator is we would take the pH at the equivalence point, and we want that to be equal to the pKa of the indicator. So that is how we choose the correct indicator to use. And it's very important to be able to do our math correctly. All right, so now that we kind of know how to choose the correct indicator, we know that uh, at the equivalence point, our endpoint, uh, those are the same. And at the equivalence point, all of my analyte has been neutralized. How in the world do I work with this math? Okay, how do I find these answers that I see that I'm trying to find here? Well, at the equivalence point, <coughs> what I can do is record my volume of the titrant that I've used. And so there's some data that I have to be collecting along here. The data the way you have to read this burette, and we'll talk about this in class, but I have to read my burette. You won't, actually won't see it like this. Zero will be at the very top. I will have to record an initial volume. So I read the volume before the titration, and I will also have to record a final volume. Okay, these are measurements that you take. Initial volume, final volume. Once I record those, all right, first of all, how do I know the final volume? Well, the final volume is the volume that I read after this has changed color, after I've reached my endpoint or equivalence point, okay? Once I record those two things, I take the change of volume. Basically, it's the final minus the initial. And what that means is the volume of the base that you have used, right? The volume that you have used in order to reach the equivalence point. So once I have that, let's see what we can figure out. Well, this is a standardized solution, right? So we know it's molarity. 
and we know its volume now that we've collected our data. So how, what is something that I can actually find uh, from those two pieces of information? Well, what I can find is moles, right? Because since molarity equals moles over liters, I can take this molarity times this volume in liters, and that will end up giving me moles of the titrant. Okay, well, that's, that's a good start, right? I will be able to find moles of the titrant. So basically, what I have found is moles of this guy. Now, if I know moles of my titrant, and what I said is that this reaction has gone to completion, right? I want to find some information about HA. So how do I get from my base to my acid? I have to look at my reaction and I do a mole to mole ratio. Well, this happens to be a one to one ratio. So I'm going to make some space here so I can do a little bit. Oh, I just really made some space, didn't I? All right. So here we go. So I said molarity times volume in liters. That's equal to the moles of my titrant because I know this information from my lab. Now, I'm just going to do the first portion of our reaction. So HA plus OH minus, that was the first part of our reaction, right? We see this is a one-to-one -one ratio. So what I have is my titrant, which is OH minus. Now, to get into moles of HA, I'm going to do a multiple -mole ratio. So moles of OH, that's what I found from this math up here, one mole of OH minus is equal to one mole of HA. You do have to pay attention to this multiple -mole ratio because you can have uh, bases that are, are strong, like uh, CaOH2, right? I would have two hydroxides there. And so you do have to pay attention to that. So, that will equal to the moles of my HA, my acid. Well, now that I know the moles of my HA, what can I do from there? So, remember, we're trying to find two pieces of information, or could be two, right? One or the other. One is we're trying to figure out the concentration, if we are trying to figure out the concentration, here's what you will know. You will know the volume of the analyte that I've used. So let's talk about that one first. If I'm trying to figure out the concentration, we know concentration is moles over liters, right? If I know the volume, I can figure out what that volume is in liters and plug it in there. And then, based upon my calculations from the lab, I know moles of the analyte as well. So all I have to do is take these moles that I've calculated, divide by the liters that I have recorded at the very beginning of the lab. So that is how I find an unknown concentration. Now, secondly, how do we figure out if we are trying to figure out the molar mass? Maybe we're trying to figure out the identity of the, uh, of the acid. We don't know what kind of acid we're using here. Well, if we remember what the calculation for molar mass is, molar mass is equal to grams over moles, right? Anytime I look at the molar mass on a periodic table, then I say, oh, okay, well, iron is 55.85 grams per mole. So any gram amount over any mole amount of the same sample will give you the molar mass. And then if I know the molar mass, I can identify what that particular acid is. So what piece of information do I have to collect at the very beginning of the titration? That would be a gram amount. Because remember, this is like a solid and we're dissolving it in water. So you'll actually measure out a, an amount of grams and you will put it into your flask. So I will know this piece of information here. 
Well, the moles I will be finding from my calculations from the lab. So what I will do is I'll take the grams that I have actually uh, recorded in the lab. I would divide uh, the moles of the acid that I found from my calculations up here. And grams divided by moles will be my molar mass. And once I know my molar mass, I then can identify which acid that I'm working with there. Okay, so these are the two main questions that they like to ask when you're working a titration. Now, I could have this opposite, right? I can have a strong acid here. I can have a weak base here. You're basically doing the same exact process. One important thing that you might want to pay attention to is being able to write the reaction that's happening there. So when you are working this multiple -mole ratio, you get that correctly. So this is a little introduction into titrations. We will actually be doing a titration in class. I hope this is helpful. I hope you have a clear understanding. Feel free to ask me questions in class if you need to. Ta-ta for now. <laughs>